Muy buenas tardes a todos. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos esta tarde. Soy Roberto Cabezas, director de Career Services de la Universidad de Navarra. Eh, un saludo muy cordial, muy afectuoso desde el campus aquí en Pamplona. Hoy tenemos un invitado muy especial, un invitado internacional muy interesante que ha tenido muchísimas experiencias profesionales de gran valor eh, en el mundo de la dirección de personas, en empresas de gran relevancia como Google, Accenture y otras empresas. Eh, André Martín, ¿no? Hello, Portland, Oregon, in the United <laughs> States, André. Uh, has opened it as a space in his agenda to talk with us about people management, talent, profile that companies need, and topics topics of great interest um, to students and alumni. The dialogue uh, will will be with our deputy uh, director of career services, Tina Monson. Go ahead, Tina, and thank you very much to you again, Andre. Thanks, Roberta. It's a pleasure to be here. Tina. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Andre, for being with us. We're really excited to have this chat with you today. And as Roberto said, we're also really interested in hearing about uh, recruitment and employment for, for recent graduates. The format for today will be sort of an interview style. So I'm going to ask Andre questions um, at towards the end of our session. If people would like to use the question and answer uh, function on Zoom, you're welcome to send your questions. And we will read them at the end for Andre and he can and he can ask them. If you don't feel comfortable writing them in English, I'm happy to help out and translate so you can write them in Spanish. Um, so Andre, despite the, the situation, at least in Spain, um, we're still trying to recover uh, as you are in the US from the effect of the pandemic on employment. Um, but I think that the world is filled with possibilities and, and many opportunities are, are hidden. Um, given your experience in different multinationals working in HR, we'd like to ask you the million dollar question. Um, how do students and recent graduates find opportunities that are hidden? I mean, is it, is it a question of preparing themselves? It is, a, is it a question of creating a powerful network um, via creativity, curiosity, being systematic? Is it the attitude that's the key? What do you, what do you think? Well, Tina, first, let me say good afternoon and thanks for thanks for having me. I'd also like to say to the audience who's out there, apologies that I don't speak Spanish. Um, I'm still mastering my first language and working on a couple other ones, Spanish and French, but in, in no way ready to, to have the conversation in that regard. So I'll do my best to, to be clear and, and make sure that you are, uh, are following along. Um, and I love the question, Tina, right? I think the pandemic for all of its stress and strife and um, just terrible moments, it offers us a brighter future. And in a couple of fundamental ways. The first one is it opens up the talent pool to work across geography, across time zone, across country, and actually puts those of us who work in these large corporations in a place where no longer are we obliged to find talent that are in our backyard. We can open our aperture and look for talent all over the world, which I find just unbelievably exciting. Um, I think secondly is it allows us all a moment to sort of redefine ourselves or more importantly, think a little bit harder about who we are and what we want. And I'll talk more about that as we move forward. And the last big um, hit, like tailwind from, from the pandemic is it's it's really put corporations in a place where there is a different war for talent, right? Gone are the days where perks like proximity and place are available to us. And now we have to say, hey, we have to have strong purposes. We have to have strong value sets because the next generation of talent, they're smarter, they're more capable, and frankly, they're more discerning. So to get to your question, right, which is what can talent do? I think the first thing I would say to you is open your aperture a little bit wider, right? See yourself as a global citizen in a global talent pool. I think secondly is get really clear about who you are and what you want. Not the role you want, not even maybe the specific industry you want to work in, but things like who do you want to work for? What kind of company do you want to work in? And what do you want your day to be like? And last but not least is I believe in the power of networks. 
Uh, there's a new book out by Rob Cross. I encourage everyone to read that's about his fundamental research that he's done for 20 years in that space. And every day I am reminded that the more powerful and broad your network is, the more the universe can align to the things that you want. And we can dive into any of those topics as we move forward. Okay, it's, I thought it was the, the, your second point about sort of defining yourself and, and knowing what it is that you want to do. Um, that, I mean, that's, it's changing. We were just talking before we started the, the seminar about you know, when we decide to study, whether it's biology or marketing or anything like that, you perhaps go into a degree program thinking, I'm going to study marketing and I'm going to work in marketing. Um, and, and really, it's a challenge, I think, for young people to have to start to think about, well, maybe I'm going to study this, but what, it is the, what, what is it that I really want to do? What am I good at? Um, and, and to it almost sounds like they're gonna to have to try lots of different things while they're studying in order to know what it is that they want to do. Um, and that, right. and I don't even wanna get into the part about how perhaps education needs to change so it can be more experiential, you know, so that they can have more experiences to learn what they're good at and learn what they wanna do. Um, but it, it is gonna require some reflection on everyone's part. You know? I think reflection on our part from the universities, but also on the students' part. You know? I think that people are gonna to have to start a little bit to think more seriously and take more time about thinking what it is they, that they wanna do. And do you think, when you said um, this different war for talent and, and, for, and for the students to think about what it is that interests them in a company, is that different? Do you think that that's different now than it used to be? Or do you think that it's, it's always, there's always been a war for talent and that the companies have to compete for certain profiles. Uh, so Tina, uh, there's a lot in there. There's a couple comments I wanna go back to in a minute, but to answer the, the last question, there are some big differences, right? When you think about the way that organizations and just for context, I've been the chief talent officer or CLO for all these big brands. So my job was really to once the town is, make sure that they are retained and engaged over time. And I think what was really true of a lot of the big companies, and these are global companies and even the local ones in your areas, is they relied on certain assets to get people intrigued and to keep them engaged. Those were, and I mentioned, they were proximity, right? If you're close to the people you work with, you will have a more engaged experience. Secondly is place. They built these wonderful campuses and wonderful lunches and you know ping pong tables and all the rest. And then they gave a lot of perks, right? So all the benefits and things we get. And what we're finding is that, you know, talent coming in today, they, they know that they ultimately, maybe not right in the moment, maybe not in your local area, maybe not for you personally, but you have more choice than you know. And with that choice means that organizations have to be much more agile in what they're providing. And so we're finding things like, hey, companies that have a really strong purpose that know why the world is better with them in it, they are gaining traction with talent. Companies that are allowing flexible working relationships, and I can give you examples down the line of places that are doing it, they tend to be winning with talent. And companies that can showcase that, hey, come to work here, not because you're a great biologist, come to work here because you wanna work in the greatest business school on earth. And we will provide you diversity of opportunity, right? That there's a talent marketplace once you get here that says, hey, if you came in and you are a scientist, there's nothing stopping you that going into sales or going into marketing or going into except two things. One, do you have a passion for it? Secondly, are you willing to build skill in it? And third, are you willing to see your career as a version of lateral moves as opposed to something that starts at the bottom of the organization and moves up to the top. And so those are just a few things that we're seeing that I find, again, really interesting as you try to create a strong employee experience. And so what, how is the, all of this, 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 this sort of the options now that companies have to offer to, how, how has that changed recruitment or has it changed recruitment? I, I think it has changed recruitment. So, you know, on, on a few fundamental places, one is, uh, you know, we're realizing that with greater flexibility of the contracts that we have with employees, it opens up pools of talent that we never would have seen 
and never would have been able to access before, right? So, you know, there's talent that when you say, hey, you know, gone are the days where all the engineers need to sit in a single office in Google. And when you remove that barrier, you've just opened yourself up to the globe. They can be at the tip of South Africa, the edge of China, or sitting right there in the Silicon Valley. And you start to go, great, now I can find talent that has the discrete skills I need. Or even more importantly, and this is one thing I wanna be able to talk to you all about, is jobs are changing really fast. Career ladders are alter, altering significantly. And there's still a set of durable skills that if you build those, you can retain agility and optionality throughout your career. So what kind of skills? I mean, what kind of skills would you be talking about there? Yeah, so I'd, I'd start with just the, some of the soft skills, like you know, this idea of a growth mindset, right? You have enthusiasm for the future. You have a bias for action. You have the ability to scan the environment, pay attention to new information, and you are able to sort of show resilience. Those are really important skills. Complex problem solving right? Um, design thinking is a really big skill set, right? That used to be the province of product designers. And now what you're seeing is, hey, those skills of being able to take a really hard problem, an unmet need for a consumer, and create a wonderful product or experience, they extend to every single aspect of our, of our existence today, right? Everything is a new problem that's not been solved. And so, you know, communication are basic skills that are really important. Uh, your ability to, to make um, quick decisions, to utilize data. Like these are some of those durable skills that ah, it doesn't matter what career you're in today. They it's all crazy. sort of get translated pretty quickly. That's right. And you said something that I want to get to in a bit, but I want to, I want to stay here because when we talk to companies um, who are recruiting younger people, one thing is that they say, no, you can, you know, you can work from home. It's flexible. Um, but Given your experience in sort of trying to retain talent, do you think that this sort of new paradigm of having people be able to work, um, have sort of different combinations and different types of contracts when you're trying to foment a sense of team, a sense of belonging to a company, do you think that that's going to, do you think it's going to work? I think it's, I think it's ultimately a challenge for us all, right? This question of, how much does proximity actually create a barrier or is the foundational element of building a strong culture? I've, I've got to tell you, I've worked remote for 25 years. Oh, wow. I've never worked at the headquarters of the company that I've worked in. And I've had, by all accounts, a pretty good career, right? And wow. part of that is, is you, have to sort of, you have to sort of see yourself as what are the elements that create culture? They are connection, they are trust, they are safety, they are understanding the motivations of your fellow team members, and they are representing the values and the strategy that the company has. And you can do that from anywhere. Now, your skill set changes. When you're not face-to-face -face with people, you have to work harder at connections, right? You have to work harder at understanding nonverbals and whether or not what you're saying is trending. You have to be open to feedback in a different way. But you know, there's been companies that have been virtual for years. I'll give you a really good example. Mars Incorporated, some of you might know M&Ms and Snickers. Yeah. And that company has grown from a 30,000 person candy company to a 150,000 person pet services company. Most amazing thing about the company is their headquarters never exceeded 100 people. They were completely virtual since the 1940s. And the way that they constructed relationships was always built on in the beginning phones and over time these virtual connections. So when the disruption of COVID happened, they're like, well, it's no different than the way we've been working for 50 years. And so there's strategies and practices on how to do it. It's just, you have to think differently about your career and the way that you spend your time. And the communication piece that you talked about, that skill of, of communicating in all the different ways of communicating is, is essential because when you talk about, you know, building trust and connections virtually, it's not easy. It, it opens up what we've seen uh, sort of to open a parenthesis here is we are in a small town in Northern Spain. So we're not in Madrid where the majority of the companies are. And when we, we love to bring uh, companies to visit us here, we have a beautiful campus, but it's hard because 
we're not in the middle of nowhere, but we're close. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the, the whole aspect of Zoom and Skype and being able to talk to you, like it's actually opened up more doors for us, yeah. I think, than, than closed doors. But in terms of, of running a company and have this sort of constant virtual aspect, I, I would think that that would be a challenge, but I, did, I had no idea that Mars was, was set up that way. So that's, that's something that I think a lot of us are gonna take away um, today. And, and from, I would, Tina, I'd love to talk, because the other side of the question is how are organizations thinking about talent, but also how are talent thinking about careers, right? And, and there's, you know, I want to give you just, and advice is cheap, so take it for what it is, but I sort of believe there's three avenues to building a career, and you need to understand which kind of bucket you sit in. The first one is those people who are craft people, right? So these are individuals who they do something so well, or they are so passionate about a single thing that it kind of defines who they are. In the early days, think about the artisans, the furniture makers, the artists and painters, and now think about the modern era where someone like me, I've been in leadership development and talent my entire life. It's my craft. When you develop career as craft, there's certain ways you need to think about your orientation to the companies you live and work with. The second area is I'm of company, right? I found a place that speaks to every value, every sensibility, every mission-driven, cause-driven part of me. And I wanna spend the rest of my life here making this great. There's a certain way you need to create that career. And then last but not least, and I don't think we give enough credit for this, is there's a lot of people who think about career as a means to an end. I work because I wanna get out at five o'clock because I have this full, rich, deep, unbelievable life. And my career is just a means to doing those things. And you got to know where you fall at any stage in your career, and it will change, right? But asking the question of what is my motivation? Am I of craft? Am I of company? Or am I just of life? It helps you orient the way that you structure your career and the opportunities you look for. It does. And, and, and I think it's interesting that you say you can move through the different, you can change. And, and, and this actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the last question because you, we, you've touched on it and before, and, and I think this might be the moment to, to actually change the order um, of the questions that I had that we're all having to keep changing and change is okay. And we're all going to have to keep learning new skills, um, recycle ourselves, not just to keep our jobs, but also to just stay stimulated and interested and you know, sort of keep up with the times. I mean, the, it's sort of a, a really old example at this point, but going digital and, and learning all of the, you know, the Zoom and how to start a session and all these sort of things that for some people is new and it's a, and it's a challenge. Um, how, did, how would you, I mean, do you have any advice for us on, for those of us who are already working, how do we keep up with all the new things that we're supposed to be learning? I mean, from, from, from where I'm sitting, it looks like, the space of having to learn to do something new, like a Zoom meeting, the space is reducing. It's not like I'm gonna learn how to do this and then in five years, I'll have to learn how to do something else. I mean, pandemic or not, or maybe in another six months, I'm gonna to have to learn how to program or something like that. So here's what I would say to you is again, um, as an educator, which you are as well, there's no limit to the knowledge that is available to us today. I mean, I like I wake up every day just in complete awe of if anybody wants to become anything in the world, they can go and do it and they can probably do it for free. And so the question isn't how do I keep learning? The question is, what do I actually need to learn about? And I think I watch my son, I have a 15 year old son. I love him to death. He acquires information and knowledge at a rate that is just mind blowing to me. The question I always ask him is I'm like, what are you going to do with it? Right, because he'll sit on his phone or screen and he'll learn about civil rest in Russia or civil unrest in Russia. He'll learn about how to, you know, create the world's best meatball. He'll learn about architecture or science. And I'm like, but where's it going? And I think we have to sort of look at the knowledge available to us and ask the question of, hey, what is my craft? What is my skill set? What are the adjacencies to that skill set? If I got a little bit better at those things, I would be really good at the core things I care about. 
And then where do I find that information and stay focused on a few questions at a time? I always, or I spend every morning I get up and I spend about an hour learning. It's reading newspapers, it's reading books, it's going through articles. I can give you article after, you know, sort of research report. But what I do is I hold a question, right? So right now, one of my questions I'm sitting with is, is are people truly inspired right now or are they exhausted? What would more inspiration do for us if we could just feed that a little bit more? And I gotta tell you, like, I can look at my newsfeed and see things that are about inspiration now. I can look at res research reports and find data that's interesting, but you gotta hold a question. And the questions that are just adjacent to the core things you do, those are the ones you should be paying attention to because they will broaden your skill set and allow you to be better at what you do, therefore yeah. be seen, and therefore continue to progress. It's and so really, then. maybe companies and in, in, you know, management of a company should make, it should be perhaps something that we should look for in a company. If I, if I were a student who's graduating right now as a characteristic of an employer that I'm looking for, perhaps someone that is giving me these opportunities to learn or is helping me learn or giving me time out of my day every day to, to learn something new, suggesting things that I should, should learn. Is that when we had also mentioned when we talk about retaining talent or, or bringing talent in and onboarding talent, um, you know, do companies spend enough time and sort of explaining who they are and, and, and letting people know what is expected of them when they start working? Some, some, Tina, some are really bad at it. Some do it really well. Uh, and I, you know, it goes back to, hey, I just am a believer that you got to own your own career. You know, and, and here's, I, I spent a lot of time at a research institute called the Center for Creative Leadership. And that whole sort of place, it's one of the largest executive development firms in the world, CEOs and leaders from the top multinationals come in every year in droves to sort of do their, their programs. And the lesson that has stayed with me to the end of time is this, is that we all have the same key events that happen to us. We learn to run projects, we work on teams, we face turnarounds, we have hardships, we are part of startups, we are asked to innovate. And the people who separate themselves as folks who are good, but then fall off, right? There are um, hero to zero mentality versus those that continue to progress and grow, whether that's up or just in richness. There's one key difference. The people on this side, they take those key events and they turn them into lessons of experience. They look at them and say, what was that? What happened? What did I do? What did I learn? How do I either do that more in the future or less? And they're in that constant reflective loop. And here's the end of the sentence is, I've been in learning and development my entire life. I've done education for the largest brands in the world. The thing I will tell you is that nobody needs a development program to grow. And nobody needs someone to create an opportunity for you to take a class. Life is the greatest development program on earth. And if you mind the experience you have, there are just amazing small and big places where you can grow in ways that I find phenomenal. So one of the things I tell my organizations is, hey, stop trying to teach people everything mm -hmm. and start trying to show, start trying to remind them of how to learn how to learn. Because I think that's what we tend to forget. When we work, we don't realize everyone those experiences are learning experiences. Everyone those yeah. opportunities are opportunities to get feedback and grow and change and be better. Um, and if we saw them that way more often, I think we would probably look a little bit differently at, at our organization and say, God, it's just a giant platform of learning. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it is. And so I say, I often say these large companies are the biggest, best business schools in the world. Um, because they offer you everything you need to know about how to run a business. So do you, if, if you were going to talk to a young professional who's starting out right now, um, perhaps one of the skills that not only communication, as we talked about before, but um, maybe that willingness to want to learn and incorporate what they're learning. I mean, what are some of the, what are some of the competencies, competencies or, or skills that, that you think that young candidates should have today in the selection process? I mean, how would they stand out? Well, hey, I, I think there's, there's a few things that, that I believe make candidates stand out. Um, the first one is, is the best know who they are. 
and they are vulnerable and authentic about what they bring, right? So, so when they come to a place, they've, they've done the work to say, I know who I am. I know the skills or superpowers I bring. I know how I'm unique in the world. And I know my story that tells you I have grit. I have a growth mindset. I can persevere. And I will work conscientiously to make this firm better. I mean, those are the ones that I get really excited about. Um, I think the second thing that, that allows candidates to stand out is uh, they're really clear about the alignment of the company, not the role, but the company that they're joining and why it matters to them. So they understand the value match and they can sort of talk about, hey, this is where I came from, right? I, I grew up as the son of two educators who worked in a university that gave rural impoverished youth a debt-free education. I saw when I was eight years old, the power of education to change people's lives. And from moment one, I knew that that was the reason I was entering the work world, right? So, I mean, I was 21, I knew that. And I could talk about it because I had explored that and I thought about it and I understood why I was doing what I wanted to do. So if the first one is know who you are, Second one is know how your values connect to the companies that you're trying to join. I think the third one is, is really, um, it's humility, right? One of the things that, that I see in, um, in many applicants that come is they're in a rush to, and I say this playfully, to be the CEO, Yeah. right? It's all ambition. It's all, look what I've done, look who I am, look what, and, and companies are actually saying, hey, yeah, that's important. Like, we love that. We love ambition. But there's also a place for humility and, and realizing that you're coming here to learn and that the people in the place you're joining actually has a lot to teach you. Um, that's something that I think a lot of companies find really attractive. I'll point to Mars again. I remember Mars, like when we used to do recruiting, they never recruited from the top universities in the world. They never went to your Harvards and your Yales and your MITs and your, in, in your, you know, your other universities. They said, hey, what we really want is we want tier two universities, places that are, that get more of um, a diverse population. We actually want candidates that had paid for their school or worked all the way through their schooling. Mm -hmm. And then we want people that have diversity in their background right, that they might have two or three majors. And when you ask the question why, it's like, because we want people that, that have grit, yeah. that, have, that know how to work hard. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's really telling for me. I remember this story a long time ago. It was this brother and sister. They were in New York, um, and they chose not to go to college. They had great grades, got in the best universities. They went to New York for three years, lived in a studio apartment, did all their um, education off of free learning, created their own degree. And then after four years, after completing an equivalent degree, they wrote a cover letter to the company saying, hey, you can hire the person that graduated from Harvard, or what about hiring me? I moved myself in the middle of nowhere to Brooklyn, New York. I lived in a studio apartment with my sister. I worked full time in the grittiest place in the world. And I designed my own education. So I'm more prepared for anybody to do X. And I got to tell you, they got jobs in a nanosecond, right? Because in their experience of school, they were able to show how committed they were to doing something real. And so, they had and, and they had experiences while they were that while they were learning, you no, know, and it made them authentic. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they incredible. Did. They they can back up sort of what they were saying. If if yeah. that that is something that we we do encourage students while they're studying. Um, I think sometimes there's this idea, oh well. You know, if I'm working in a restaurant or in catering or if I'm taking care of kids, that's not a real job. Um, and we often have to tell them, hey, no, you're working a lot of skills that you're going to be learning, that you're going to be using when you enter the job market. You have to be responsible. You have to be organized. You have to be able to organize your time between your, your responsibilities that you have with your job and your responsibilities that you have while you're doing your degree. And, and every job opportunity, I think, is an opportunity to learn. And, and I think um, one message that I hope that that people take away today is it's great if you, you know, if you have an internship in a sector that you're interested in where you see yourself working, but it's also okay to be doing other types of jobs uh, because it just, it, 
it widens your profile and, I, and it gives an opportunity to, to learn. And it's- See, I, I wanna stay there for a second because I, I have a really, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good, you know, solid narrative behind that, which is I used to work a, ro- a lot with uh, the retail employees at Target, mm-hmm. right? And, and they, they would work, you know, they were sort of hourly workers, working in retail, running cash registered, restocking shelves. And even the team leaders in those in those outfits, I would say, I you know, I just think you underestimate the types of skills you're building, right? Yes, you are working in an hourly retail store, but you are becoming an expert in customer service. You understand retail consumers. You are able to think about merchandising a product. You are able to create you know stronger ways to organize in this case, shelves or any other work for that matter. And I'm like, don't mistake that you're, you're learning a lot of the core skills that a general manager of a large business, large business needs to have. And that analogous context is something I think we, we undervalue. You know, mothers return to workplace. I'm like, I was raised by a single mom, right? I know how hard that job is when you have three boys who are two years apart. I mean, wow. it, is, it is harder than almost any CEO job in the world. And she did it with poise and grace and effort. And I don't believe the world at that time was ready to appreciate the skills that she built. I think we are now. And so don't underplay those analogous experiences. They matter. And if you position them right, they can be amazing narratives around who you are, what you stand for, and what you'll get as a, we're we're product, we're brand. Um, And those brand stories start to matter. And you have a lot of experiences that you looked at, you go, God, I, I learned a lot there. And I can translate that into these places. Exactly. And that's oh, sorry, I, I, a little bit of no, soapbox, but I. No, no, I no. I, and I, I agree because that's one of the things that we, I think, should have to try and help the students is how do I take that, my experience, and communicate it properly to explain why I'm a candidate for a job? And, and, and it's a challenge because it's that when you talked about sort of the three things that can make you stand out of, you know, know the value that you could bring to a company as someone who's 21 or 22 years old finishing a degree program. And they're a little bit unsure of, of what it is they're going to bring, but mix that with, with humility. Because one of the a message that we get from the students sometimes is, how am I going to explain that I can bring value to your company when really I haven't worked yet? So, you know, it's like they're, they're aware there's sort of like this dichotomy. They're thinking, well, how am I going to tell them that I know what I'm doing when I really haven't worked yet? And, and it is an effort to explain to recent graduates, hey, you've done things. I mean, let's let's look and see what you've done, and don't undersell the fact that you've been a class representative, or you know that you were on the the speed skating team. I mean, there's all sorts of experiences. I think that sometimes um, students tend to almost like they disqualify from from you know what what they're actually how they're spending their free time, and that it can be it can be useful for them. And I'm seeing here that we have some questions. Um, awesome. What do you think? You ready? I'm ready. Let's give it a run. Okay. So um, let's see. So I think Leticia was first. I'm going to ask her question and then Paula's question. Uh, Let's see. I'm only seeing Paula's question. So I'm going to read it first. And she says, thank you for the useful advice on rail. It's actually in English. I would, uh, I would like to ask you something. What if you are a company professional as opposed to a craft employee or a, a life person? I love my company. How can you develop a project if you are not the boss or if it is hard to make it understood by your managers? And also, is it possible to combine both profiles, being a company and an, being a, a company and a life person? So let me take the second part of that first, which is, is it possible to be both? It is. I just always find that the boundary changes, right? So. When you, are, when you are constructing a rich life, yeah, your career can be full and you can be a crafts person, you can do those things. But it's just remembering that, you know, for folks who, who are looking at the job as a means to an end, they have a different contract, which means instead of spending 100 hours at the company, they're going to set clearer boundaries on their work because the other pursuits they have outside matter as much as, as the job does. And so you absolutely can. It's just more of a, it's more of a reflection moment of which is primary for you. Are you building a craft? Are you building depth of a relationship with the company? Or are you trying to use your job as a way to build a better life? And I think just remembering all those things are intertwined, but if you can say one's primary at any moment in your career, it helps you think about your job. Um, I think secondly is, how do you develop a project if you're not the boss or it's hard to be understood by your manager? 
hey, it is ultimately the most difficult thing for early career individuals to absorb, which is I have all this ambition, all this new thinking, all this energy that I want to put to stuff. And oftentimes our roles are very narrow and the managers we live and work with don't see us for who we fully are. And so a few things I would say to you. Um, one is, is when you look for a position, I personally believe it's important to, to hire, it's, a, it's important to take the job that's with a really good manager as it is to take the perfect job on paper. And I always did that throughout my career. I literally chose my manager first, my company second, my job third because who you work for, it matters. When you work for a great manager early in your career, you know it because that question will never come up because they will be listening to you, looking to you, putting you in, in places where you're gonna get to showcase who you are and actually gain new skill. They're a star maker, right? And so early in your career, try to be choiceful about who you're working for. Um, it matters in big ways. If you find yourself working in a manager that it's hard, what I would say to you is, is use your voice in the ways that companies allow you to, right? So there's no harm in providing a manager a new idea, right? Early in my career, I remember spending time, I was at, um, I was at Harshman Associates working a small consult consultants. I literally once a day provided Carl, the owner, a new idea. Most of them were bad right? Most of them were ill-informed, um, but a few of them struck a chord and allowed him to see that I am an innovator. I'm someone who wants to help grow the business. And so it may not be that you get to do all the projects you want to do, but I would say never lose that sense of looking at the world of how you can make it better and sharing those ideas. Because what does it ultimately say to the company? I'm motivated. I'm engaged, I care about this place, and I wanna make it better. And then the second thing I'd say to you is in the projects you do have, do them exceptionally well. Although we don't work in places where every talent's visible, we're still learning how to create an inclusive environment where everyone can be seen. I do find that work tends to flow to people who do good work. <laughs> You do good work, eventually you're going to get to do better work. You do better work, you're going to get to do even better work. And so I believe that as careers. I know it's not everyone's experience, um, but I do believe if you focus on taking the piece of work that's in front of you, the little nugget you have to work with and making it as beautiful as you can, someone will eventually see it. That's great um, advice. As opposed to trying to network your way to a better career. That's great advice. I found Leticia's question, and, it, and this is really interesting, and I think this is an experience that a lot of students have shared. So, hey, Andre, we all know that remote working gives one endless possibilities, but don't you think that for a recent graduate, not, being part, not to be able to be a part physically of the corporation is dangerous? I've done a remote internship, and my sense of belonging seemed reduced, virtual, and kind of cold. Really yeah, I, 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 do, I do think there's some danger in it. Um, I couldn't agree more. Here, here's what I would say to you is remote working is going to be an available option. And frankly, it's just not for everybody. And it's not for every type of job. And part of what's innately in that experience is for some people that does feel really distant. It does feel really cold. It does feel really disconnected. I mean, if you're highly extroverted, if you get a ton of energy from being with people and you like to work in those environments, working remote can be really hard. And there's a lot of people that generally would say, oh my God, if I never have to go back in the office again, I won't. But again, I go back to, hey, the experience ultimately is, do you feel connected to the people you're working with? That can be if I'm sitting next to them or it can be by a computer. Are you fulfilled by the work you're getting to do? Is someone allowing you to be seen, right? And is the company finding ways to commit you to their purpose? And if those things aren't happening, every experience feels cold. But I will tell you, I've worked in a lot of corporate environments where I was surrounded by people and I've never felt more disconnected or lonely or cold 
And so it exists in both ways, right? And I think it's finding the perfect fit for you. Um, early in your career, I would say, hey, it's better to be around people because the more you get to see people work, the better you'll be able to find the better practice. Um, if you're not, there's just strategies you need to use to create those connections and create those, those opportunities to learn and they're available. And Daniela has another question, which actually is a great segue. And she says, what is the best way to know what the company, the company's environment before working there? Uh, I love this question. So four things I always do is there's a, um, there's a website called Glassdoor. Yeah. It has a lot of uh, reviews. So I look at the employee reviews online. Now, often those reviews are by disgruntled employees. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Secondly, is I look for, um, and again, this works for large multinationals, not smaller businesses, is I often look for um, who appears on the best of, the greatest of, the most admired, the whatever list. Um, that's a pretty good barometer. Um, and then the third one is I use LinkedIn. Right? I use LinkedIn and, and there's two ways to use it. One is to connect to people who are currently working there. I don't. I know very few people who are on LinkedIn that if you ask them a question, they're not willing to answer it for you. It's part of why the, yeah. the whole system works. And if you are um, on that, the second thing I look at is I look at people who, um, I look at companies where people go and leave pretty quickly. Right, You see a lot of firms where you, if you look at you know, five or six people, the company will start to be over there for a year or 12 months or 18 months. And you start to go, wow, that's, those are short tenures. Um, and so that's another thing that I tend to do is, is look at it that way. That, you know, the third is pay really close attention to the hiring process, right? The hiring process, the way they construct recruiting says a lot about what the company values. Um, and the way that they come through that conversation with people will tell you a lot about who they are, what they care about, what the people are like, what they're looking for. Um, and so just hold that value lens over the recruiting process. And I think you'll, you'll start to learn a lot. It's a great question. So I have, and I have a question actually related to that. And then maybe time for one more question. What would be some, some good signs like green lights in a recruiting process and some red flags in a recruiting process? Uh, so I think that the green lights are um, when they reach out to you, they make it personal, right? So it tells me that they they understand talent. They're looking at you as an individual, right? So when, you know, when they reach out or when you've made contact and they make it really personal, I think that's important. Um, when they When they are in a good deal of contact with you when they are making a number of different ways to contact with you during a recruiting process, even if they're not moving to keep you sort of um, aware is a sign that they, they generally are employee centric, right? There's a lot of companies that you hear once and you don't hear back for four months, all of a sudden they pop back up. They're like, hey, we'd love you to come in for an interview. And you're like, well, where have you been the last four months? I'm a yeah. human sitting here waiting for a job. <laughs> so if they're in contact, that's probably a really good sign. Um, the third is that you get to meet the manager early and that they allow you to meet with the team. So I find companies that let the team be a part of interviewing processing, your peers, they tend to, again, be very team centric, very collaborative, very open, more transparent. That's another really good sign. Um, and I, you know, I also say if they ask you early, what are your hopes or aspirations? Okay. What do you want to achieve in the world? What do you care about, right? So if they move beyond those competency-based questions and actually ask about you, okay. again, that tends to be another green light you should look out for. All right, and re any red flags? Um, I, so the red flags, I would say the red flag, <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Um, I think the red flag, the biggest red flag is, is gaps. Yeah, right. Okay. The second red flag is they they hire you quickly. Right. If they hire you really quickly, they tend to treat recruiting like a machine. Okay. You know, they're basically looking for numbers and they get enough numbers in, then they'll, you know, they'll let everyone else figure it out downstream. <laughs> uh, I, I think another red flag to just be um, be super frank is if and again, this isn't always true, but if all of your contact is through an intermediary, an intermediary, so like a technology. If you find that the majority of recruiting has you interfacing with a computer, not a person, that's sometimes a red flag for me. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Andre. That's this has really been so interesting. This this dialogue with you, I really appreciate it. Um, 
and thank you everyone who's who's connected and we'll keep in touch andre um i would love to and if i can ever be of service um any questions that you didn't get asked that you want to ask me another way i mean team you know how to find me and i'm happy to Great. to help i've been spending you know 25 years building careers i'm not going to stop tomorrow and it's just it's exciting to have a new network and a new group of people out there in the world um you know trying to do good things and, and move their own careers forward so absolutely appreciate you giving me the time okay well for everyone else who's out there you can follow us um at at career unav um and there's going to be a short survey at the end when we end this, when we finish the session right now and have a good afternoon everybody thanks bye